Very good. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Um, we are, I guess, um, what would be called, Katie? It's not live, is it live streaming? Yes. We are live streaming this class also, but the camera is not on the audience. Yeah. The, can, uh, the audience, yeah. hello, people at home. Um, <laughs> They, they only see uh, the PowerPoint presentation, but they can hear the class um, and it is going to be recorded so that people, you can watch it again at another time. So thank you for being here. Thank you for taking part at University Express. It's one of my favorite programs. Um, and thank you to Katie Earl and Erie County and Kitty and Elisa for um, getting this program um, so much deserved press and classes and instructors, and it's it's awesome. So uh, without further ado, Kitty is going to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all your help with the project. No so problem. I'm Kitty. I'm with Erie County Senior Services. Um, we work right down at the RAF, and without our partners, like all of the senior centers that we work with in Erie County and some of the libraries, this would not be possible. And also without our speakers. So Harry has been a part of University Express for many years. And actually today I would like to honor him. Oh, wow. Whoa. For being a part of this year's University Express. And we'll be giving these to our speakers each semester for those who participate. And you can hang them up in your office. You can wear them home. Show your kids, grandkids. <laughs> Some people love those. You know, they're You're, great. We just started doing that this year. I will be offering eight by uh, eleven gloves. <laughs> <laughs> we do have the down. autograph page in the back of the passport book too, if anyone has right. the passport. Okay. Um, so you could get Harry's autograph. But just know that senior services downtown Erie County, we have so much that we offer, uh, including University Express. But we have state fit dining. We have our. Uh, nutrition counseling, we have frozen meals, yeah. we do farmer market coupons. Question? You just mentioned the passport. Is that happening this semester? Yes, I'll talk. I can talk to those oh, I haven't seen them. who are okay. interested in that. Yeah, new ones, he said the we spring do. ones. Well, we might have been recycling those. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a fall passport, yes, yeah. but I'll bring those in. Okay. They're in my car. So I usually don't come out to Chictawaga, but I wanted to see the um, streaming done here at this center. I'm kind of like a South Towns connection. Um, so anyway, I'm glad to be here today and just know that we have so many things to offer Club and give us a call. Club 99. Club 99, that's right. Are you a member? Awesome, see? Club 99 is awesome. That's our exercise program that happens at different centers throughout Erie County, but we also do that virtually. There's a virtual Club 99. You can log on at home. Yes. And, and it's free. And sometimes I look for exercise programs at home and I, I'll, I'll stream on, on TV looking for them, but they're always, you got to pay for them, you know? So this one's free. So think about that. Julie and Eric lead that class and they are awesome, right? And we have a testimony right here in the front row. Um, so let me talk about Harry for a little bit. Um, Harry Meyer first became interested in architecture while working on a college internship at the National Electric Company of Greece. Besides visiting many of the historical buildings in Athens, he also traveled to several, several Greek islands, including Greece. He has been giving tours of Buffalo City Hall and also volunteering at the Darwin Martin House um, for over 25 years. Awesome. Harry is a founding member of Explore Buffalo. Yeah. How old is Explore Buffalo? 10 years. 10 years. So that's awesome. I love the whole program. And he presently gives tours of Silo City, downtown Buffalo City Hall, and the Delaware Ave Mansion. So let's welcome Harry. Here he is. Thanks for being here. Okay, before I get into talking specifics, I want to give uh, a shout out to University Express and encourage you. The talk I'm giving today basically was something suggested uh, by Katie Earl to me a couple years ago. It takes me a while to uh, develop the PowerPoint, but just earlier this week, I did one on the ice boom. 
And that was another one which was suggested by University Express, but it was based on suggestions and comments by people like you. So I realize they have an extensive catalog, but if you see things uh, missing, so to speak, and you want to raise that either here with Dawn and she can pass it along or contact uh, the University Express folks like Kitty, like Katie uh, directly. Uh, they'll try to find somebody, in other words, uh, yes. to do that. And it's been fun for me to develop these. Sometimes it takes a, a little bit of effort to hunt up uh, pictures. I'm always looking for improvements. Uh, uh, so that's my little commercial. Yeah, and I have an example of that. So someone asked if we could do a class on uh, how you stream at home or use a smart TV or what's Roku, what's Apple TV, what's Par You know, there's so many different options. So we are looking for someone who could give a class on that. How to use your Fire Stick, your Roku, your uh, Apple TV remote, for those types of things. Don't look at me for technological. <laughs> and I don't need we need to know people to ask, by the way. You know, we have a hint at what they might have a background in. But if anybody knows someone uh, that could speak to that, uh, that would be awesome. Because it is... It is the future, and but it can also help cut cable costs too. Cable TV costs. Most of the people who are highly skilled in that are in high school. I know, right? <laughs> that's right. Because I was going to say someone who could speak to this audience. Um, that's kind of what we're looking for. And that's a little so. hard to do. Yeah. When, when when I finish up, uh, uh, believe me, I'm more than happy to stay here and answer your question. Uh, and I'll take questions as we go along. Sometimes you know to keep the flow going. Um, I have to stop the question, but before I even start, I want to mention, and you're welcome to look at these uh, when I come up here. I have a few things I bought and I brought, I bought. Uh, but this book uh, is a whole series of photographs of the grain elevators in Western New York, many of them at that silo city, which is down off of Ohio Street. And it's interesting, the fellow who did the book is kind of a, what you'd call a semi-pro photographer, uh, but he was a professor at the University of Buffalo in their English department, Bruce Jackson. And if any of you have ever gone to Klein Hands when the Just Buffalo Literary Series uh, is on, you'd find uh, uh, him lurking around, taking photographs of the speaker being interviewed. Uh, and when he did most of this work, he was accompanied by folks from the School of Architecture and Planning at UB. Uh, and as I said, it's primarily the, the photos are at Silo City, but there are other ones. Uh, one, uh, the H.O. Oates uh, uh, facility, which I believe was basically where the uh, Seneca uh, Casino is. So that's one book that I've got here. Another one is part of a rather well-known series. Sometimes these are Eh, a little sketchy, uh, 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 you could call them vanity press at times, but the Arcadia series, in this case, about the Buffalo waterfront, I found it fascinating. Uh, I have a little bit of a background in that um, my Uncle Harry, uh, who's a common name in the, in the family, uh, he was a sailor on the Great Lakes up until the uh, time that uh, Shipping kind of fell off dramatically with the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And then he went off uh, 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 ocean tankers. I also had, and I can still remember both these guys, uh, my mom's uncle. But I mean, these were my great uncles or grand uncles. I always confuse that. They were ship captains uh, on the Great Lakes uh, for a long time. So there's, I would hear family history about sailing on the, on, on the Great Lakes and how things have changed. This is a good book to get into it. And then lastly, although it does mention in one of the uh, uh, articles or vignettes, the Silo City, this book came out a couple years ago, Secret Places of Buffalo. The woman who came up with this idea and did the book, uh, Elizabeth Lakata, is the one who is the publisher of Buffalo Spree Magazine. Uh, I, I say that's Buffalo's equivalent of L. I mean, I, the articles in there are always neat, and they've got good recommendations, I think, for uh, restaurants to try out. But you're welcome to look at these. Uh, just don't walk off with them. Do you know if the library has those books? 
Um, I haven't done that. I wouldn't be surprised uh, that particularly the American Chartre, and I should have mentioned uh, the term American Chartre is uh, drawing attention to the European uh, cathedrals, a beautiful one in France, in Chartres, and in particular, it's because many of the European architects, whether they were French, whether they were German, they looked at our grain elevators, and in fact, one guy summed it up, uh, Mies van der Rohe, less is more. In other words, they're simple structures, but there's a beauty to them. And one of the techniques on photographing these things, and there was actually for 12 years at Silo City, uh, this is the first year they're not doing, guy came up from Atlanta, Georgia, professional photographer, and he taught a class specifically uh, to professionals and if you paid the money, you could go as well. But the idea was to go around to some of the abandoned sites, including those that the city of Buffalo owns that say no trespassing. There's a couple along the Buffalo River. And I got invited to do that. I just didn't want to go to jail. I didn't, but no, the basic point is there is beauty uh, in the simplicity of the structures. And one way they can bring that beauty out is just to set a camera up and let it take pictures like every five or 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And as the sun moves, mm -hmm. as the clouds come over, the difference that you see, the subtle difference. The only thing that I can really remember is the uh, one time I saw the Grand Canyon, I just sat in amazement for a couple hours on the rim and watched the colors change. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing that you're seeing, but you're seeing it in a different fashion. All right, I could, I could, uh, go on for, for a long time. I also have one picture, uh, which you'll see from the slide, but I want to hold off and tell you what that's about. All right. I start off uh, as a basic primer, and in particular, I do have a uh, yardstick uh, because it doesn't uh, take a, a laser print. Uh, but this is very early, you can see it's 1805. It was done by a fellow, if you'd recognize the last name, it's Joseph Ellicott. He was a land surveyor. Uh, he got his job from the uh, Holland Land Company, which literally bought the western 60 miles of New York State, running all the way uh, from Pennsylvania to Lake Ontario. And the Dutchman, who never came over here, they were smart to hire a guy like him, and he had upwards of 100 people working for him. Don't get me wrong. He didn't do all this stuff. But basically, he gave them a better idea of what they own. But beyond that, he also became the local sales agent, and he had an idea for them how they could sell the land. Because initially, the Dutch, they wanted to do it in and out. The, the, the term currently would be, they, they wanted to flip the property. Uh, only problem was that nobody had enough money to buy it from the Dutch. So his idea, and I'm sure this must have shocked the heck out, out of these people because they were, they were money lenders for the most part. And they had helped finance the American Revolution. He, he told them to sell property, you got to give it away. It, it just sounds inconsistent. But what he meant was in order to provide amenities and uh, backup support for people to come here, buy land and get into farming, or just even to pass through to go to Indiana and, and uh, Ohio and places west, uh, you needed to have places where they could stay. So if you and a spouse were willing to set up a tavern, overnight lodging, you might get free land from him. The big giveaway, and not many of us would think of this to, today, the big giveaway was to the state of New York because he was the one who convinced them what we really need here is a reliable way to move people around. We need transportation. And so he was the one, I think it was something like 100,000 acres of their land was given to the state of New York for the Erie Canal. Erie Canal opened, you know, 1825. That's the economic engine which really uh, jump starts Buffalo. Now, speaking of Buffalo, down here, we have Buffalo Creek. Uh, over there, it's harder for you folks, but believe me, it says Little Buffalo Creek. If anybody asks you where did Buffalo get its name, it's not the beau fleur of the corruption of the French for a beautiful river, which I remember when I was in high school, uh, Father Hennepin supposedly sees the Niagara and goes, ah, beau fleur. 
Uh, the historians say they can't find any of that evidence of that for 65 years in writing. And lo and behold, uh, he and LaSalle, he being uh, Father Hennepin, they went west uh, and they were in Wisconsin. There's a Wisconsin county called Buffalo County and Buffalo River. And guess what? They got the same story. Buffalo <laughs> River. Uh, and the same thing with the historians there. No evidence. Uh, um, my favorite, and this is going to get uh, into the, the, the real unknown. Uh, uh, have a couple inquiries going with a linguist over at McMaster University, as well as uh, I've, I've asked this question at UV. But the basic point is uh, the uh, kind of the most likely is a type of fish. Uh, which we know today as the buffalo or the big mouth buffalo. It's also got the other word sucker on the end of it. <laughs> and the guy in Minnesota, who's the mayor of Buffalo Lake, um, uh, he made this statement several years ago. He said, we ought to f face it that our, our particular city is named after a bunch of suckers. And he says, the Chamber of Commerce is going to hate me for this. But anyway, I wanted to point 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 out the Buffalo Creek. And I also on a type, this is not a roadmap type of thing. This is not current construction at that time. 1805, I don't know how many people, the first census, eight, uh, 1810 is about 1500, uh, but this was a plan which Ellicott had for where he saw the future of the lands that the Dutch had bought. He saw it all the way here on the western end and he wanted to sell a lot of lots. Uh, I'll also tell you, the big land down there, one speculation I have, you know, that area flooded. It was marshy, uh, particularly before they had uh, breakwater, uh, break walls down there. Be that as it may, I just focus on that buffalo. Okay. When we talk about the grain elevators, when we talk about Silo City in particular, uh, we're talking about this area, uh, and you can't see too well, but right there is the Ohio Street Bridge. That was closed for about a year and a half for repairs. It's back open, and that bridge plays a very important role in the current flower production because of this facility, uh, which is on the other side from Silo City. That's an active series of grain elevators on what's called St. Clair Street, and the facility that manufactures the flour, crushes the flour, it's all the way over here. That's the one that had the Great Northern uh, grain elevator, uh, which was not in use for a long, long time. But the flour mill, believe me, from like the 1930s on, it was huge. It used to be Pillsbury. It's now owned by a company called Archer Daniels Midland. If you go to Riverworks, which is across the street uh, uh, in this area here, it used to be uh, uh, grain elevator over there. But the basic point is this active flour mill here doesn't have storage space for the grain to crush beyond a couple days. They have a bunch of trucks. It's like a, a constant stream of trucks some days bringing the grain across the Ohio Street Bridge. And when that was closed, they had to go all the way down uh, to where the Michigan Avenue Bridge and come back up Ganson Street. But that is an active flour mill as is where they make the Cheerios. They make the flour there as well, uh, though it's General Mills has. Is there anybody here who has not smelled Cheerios when they're baking? <laughs> you know, that's something when people, if, if you have them in from out of town, and what, what is that? If you're down by Canal Side or stuff like that, you just tell them it's Cheerios or maybe Lucky Charms. That's the other one which they, they make there. Switching colors for a moment up here. Those are owned by the city. Those were big grain elevators. I mean, really big. This was the largest one in the world at, a, at one time, World War I. So important to uh, US food supply. They actually had military troops during World War I guarding the thing. Long since closed, off limits, if you will. This one, this one, and this one over here, uh, which is called Marine A, uh, and I give uh, walking tours to that. Point simply is, all three of those closed in 1962. Uh, you'll hear the statement that it was the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway killed the grain storage business in Buffalo. Um, not exactly uh, accurate, uh, total, 
one of the biggest things, and I keep trying to find uh, written evidence. I mean, I've heard about this. Uh, we used to have something called the Interstate Commerce Commission, which set rail rates. And it was literally cheaper to send grain from the Midwest. Uh, I'll pick on Minneapolis, send it to Buffalo, crush it here, then send it to the East Coast, then to crush it in Minneapolis and send it direct. Uh, 1962, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which I don't think exists anymore, they, uh, they backed off and they, and they changed the rates, which had been the favorable rates, which had been in existence for a long time. So this area in through here, and it's interesting, the, the place they give the tours, is, it looks like it's a vacant lot. It would have been number 13 there. I don't know why when somebody uh, came up with this, uh, they, they were very superstitious. <laughs> And this is an aerial photograph of what we call uh, Silo City. And one recent addition, right down here, that used to be a, an administrative office building. Uh, the fellow who owns it owns a company right out here on Ohio Street called Rigidized Metals. Very creative with what they do with shiny metals, whether it's titanium, stainless, uh, nickel, you name it. Uh, but he's the one that bought this whole area with the exception of what Carl Palladino owns here. Uh, about 14 acres in all these uh, buildings down here. He actually bought this from a, a separate thing. Total purchase price, $160,000. Uh, but it's a, it's a liability. And what he was intending to do is take the facility along here, which is a bunch of silos, turn it into an ethanol plant. This was 2006. Uh, uh, it, it didn't materialize because the economy kind of went sideways or backwards in 2007, 2008. So this area was kind of abandoned. What do you do with it? Well, uh, you do game plan B was to go to the university and set up a, uh, some interesting relationships uh, for, uh, especially down here, there's some major artworks, which I'm going to show you. I mean, big artworks. You couldn't show these in the new Albright Knox Dunlock. Uh, you see, it doesn't have the space or the height. Uh, as an aside, go to the AKG if you haven't been there. Uh, I was there a couple of times now. The, the new building is absolutely spectacular. Um, is anybody, I want to ask this question, is anybody here, uh, somebody who worked here or had family that worked here? Yes, ma'am. So in the last couple of months, I've been following Jimmy out my family tree. Mm -hmm. And I never knew this, but based on census records, I my grandfather worked in the flour mills. Well, actually, both of them. Grand, wait a minute, grandfather, great grandfather. I, I don't know which one, but they did. Okay. In fact, I I have a question. And I don't know if this is the right time, but is there any source of information to determine which ones were in existence in like 1913? Um. A lot of those were smaller. A lot of those, you'll hear me talk about okay. dangers. A lot of them burned. A lot of them blew up. Um, there is an interesting book. Has anybody ever uh, uh, read Tim Bohan's Against the Grain? Uh, uh, and he came out with this about a dozen years ago. Tim, similar to you, he just wanted to find out about his family. And he got into doing research. It's an excellent uh, uh, collection of the stories back there. Uh, one of the things I will tell you over and over uh, when I'm giving tours, um, we tend to think of other types of activity as being especially dangerous jobs. The steel mills here. Uh, my great grandfather was a coal miner uh, around Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He was blown up on a clinker pile. So that's that's why I'm here, because my great-grandmother did the Irish diaspora. She had 16 kids, and then <laughs> she had probably a sixth-grade education, and uh, you know, she sent them everywhere, including one up here. And I was always under the impression that it was the Irish immigrants that... Somewhat, but there were a lot of... I mean, my, my ancestors were Polish. So right, no, there's a, 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 a lot. You're right uh, on that. But uh, be that as it, as it, as it may... Um, the stories of people that I have had on tours who worked there uh, were of the dangers and of people being injured and people being killed. Uh, we talk about with the miners, and I realize I focused on this a little bit. 
uh, black lung disease. Yep. These guys got white lung disease. Uh, green dust does bad stuff when it gets inside. It's a little sharp at edges as far as it. Uh, good paying jobs uh, for un relatively unskilled workers, but also very dangerous. Okay, I wanted to give you, this is where sometimes before the term Silo City, this was called Elevator Alley. Uh, you can still see it. And like this young lady here, uh, been out there with her husband on a boat. It's like a canyon when you're going through it. It's, oh, it's unbelievable. It's just, they're huge. They use Billy's, uh, Billy Facillo's name. Anybody want to know, uh, guess, can you tell me what's this? It looks like a bunch of sausage links that are there. And he, you're smiling. You, you got an idea what it is, sir? Yeah, the, the ice boom. It's the ice boom. This is what used to be stored along Furman Boulevard just off the street uh, from the Coast Guard Station when they made that in the Wilson Point, which I recommend go, go there. It's a, it's a nice city park, but the point is that it's a, a stored now. This is Catherine Street. And if we had a picture, a photograph of that area, that's the mutual park and the rowing, uh, the mutual rowing club was there for a long time. But if we had a picture of that from 1880, uh, it's the darkness at noon. Uh, all coal-fired uh, businesses, a lot of metal smellery. Uh, Catherine Street was a combination of smelters and railroads. That's what it was. But now this whole area, uh, give you an example. This one last was used for flour milling in 2002, a long time ago. There was a revival after Rick Smith, uh, uh, the owner of Brigidite, decided, I'm not going to put an ethanol plant in here. He sold it uh, for a period of time to some grain dealers out of Minneapolis. They're still in the grain de dealing business. Um, but in 2016, they closed up shop. One of the reasons is they would get boatloads of grain in here and they might ship it out by rail uh, and CSX has the rail yards over there. Uh, surprise, surprise, they keep knocking on the door of the uh, grain dealers in 2015 and said, we're going to add an additional charge just so you understand. And the additional charge was $1,000 per car. That's a lot of money. Uh, but that's a beautiful area. Uh, and you can see the rail thing. Uh, this area here, that's that's the one which was uh, fixed up to uh, be the ethanol plant. You're going to hear more about American, specifically on the other side of it. Uh, I just, I, this is, uh, I mentioned this for, uh, professional photography class that came up. But I also, you, uh, it's just, to me, it's beautiful, and those are geese that are flying through there. But I also mentioned this thing here. Anybody here ever been on the Crystal Beach boat? Oh, that's, that's an that old wreck they find. Yeah, it's an old, this one's an old wreck, but I remember uh, my mom taking me on the Crystal Beach boat. I was scared. You get out there on the boat, you know, it wasn't scary. Okay. But, you know, it was an experience. Yeah. People our generation, you remember that. This boat here came to Buffalo in 2015. It was used uh, in a very similar fashion uh, in Detroit. Uh, there was an amusement park in Canada, like Crystal Beach, uh, and what happened was that closed in the 90s, and uh, uh, the ship was out of luck. Didn't have any, didn't have any customers anymore, and it sat uh, vacant. And a guy out of New York City came up with an idea. He was going to fix this boat up. He was going to uh, actually uh, take it out through the St. Lawrence Seaway, down the St. Lawrence River, around Maritime Canada and bring it to Kingston, New York, uh, which is about halfway from New York City to Albany. And it was gonna be a floating museum, but also a day tripper. Um, when they brought it to Buffalo in 2015, it was an opportunity they thought to get it repaired. I have to mention that the guy that had the money, uh, he passed away about a year after he bought the ship and it's owned by a not-for-profit. They'd love your money. Uh, <laughs> I'll put it this way, when they came in 2015, and I was giving uh, 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 tours, uh, they were telling us they wanted five million bucks and they'd be all set. Well, the next year they wanted 10 million, and then the next year it was 15 million, and then they stopped sh talking about it. Uh, we don't know. It's, 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 it, she says, wreck, it's deteriorating, I guess is the best way.
Somebody had the bright idea where we're going to protect it. They shrink wrapped it one winter. All they did is uh, set dry dry rot loose in the thing. But that boat is still there, and how much longer, I don't know. Um, this year, I have not seen a, a single soul. We used to see occasionally tour groups. Leadership Buffalo had a fundraiser there. How can you see that? Can, can you come up close? Yes, time to see. When you, there's two, two there's uh, two. Going back. Um, when I do the ground tours, we can see it in two fashion. You can peek around the corner, standing outside the Marine A silo. But I take people down into the marine A silo and we wend around a little bit. But there are three or so vantage points where you can see how badly the ship is deteriorating. Is there any street near there? No, no. I mean, this is it's oh. called Child Street, uh, is the end of it, but this is fenced off area. Okay. Uh, the good news, in one sense, is that the hull was stabilized before they towed the ship here. Uh, so apparently, it's not an imminent. Uh, danger of sinking. Uh, a couple times in the past, I've met a guy who teaches at the Maritime Academy Charter School, and his job was basically about every other week go over there and make sure it's it's not sinking. <laughs> so that All right, I want to take you back in time though. This is Canal Side. This is when it was robust, and I'll be very happy uh, to send to Dawn. And I'll tell you about it. You can find this actually by Googling, using uh, all sorts of things. There is an animated video which was done about a uh, dozen years ago. Uh, and in particular, it's set in Buffalo in 1836, the height of when things are really developing. And it's about a guy by the name of Benjamin Rathbun. And Rathbun at one time had over 2,500 people working for him. He has one building that's left downtown Buffalo. Uh, used to be what they called the Tycor building. Uh, it's Kitty Corner, uh, I guess is the best way from the family court building. It's across the street from Old County Hall. It's now owned by Erie County for back taxes, and supposedly they're going to uh, uh, use it for archive storage. But the point is, this video shows you the rapid development of Buffalo uh, as a city as a result of this, the connection from the uh, commercial, uh, this is called a commercial slip. You can go down there, these uh, uh, well, Whipple truss bridges. This thing was a constant beehive. Um, and it's 1842, major development with Buffalo and grain handling. A guy, I think this is the next thing. I'll leave. This just shows you how, how popular the place was. Look at how those, I mean, that's, that's like Hong Kong Harbor, those pictures that you used to see uh, from 100 years ago. This is what I want to show you. This is over at the History Museum. Uh, I always tell, you want to learn about Buffalo history but, and Erie County, go to the Buffalo History Museum. There's a lot of exhibits. But in 1842, I, I came up with, what, from hindsight, hey, why didn't somebody else think of that type of thing? Uh, but the guy was in the grain storage business, among other things. And he would notice how long it took commodities to be brought into his storage area. And it's only when there's grains in there that he can hold his hand out and collect rent, so to speak. Uh, because the way that they would unload boats in the 1830s and up until the time, and he suggested with an engineer that they try this. Uh, guys would go down into the ship hole with a backpack and they'd fill the backpack up and they would walk up there. They would dump the backpack and so on and so forth. It was back breaking work, but also uh, from a practical standpoint, it took a full week to unload a sailing ship here. A full week. We know well, winter's coming now, especially, um, and the, the lakes will be frozen. And so for a week, the ship owner's not getting any revenue. Uh, he's brought the cargo there, but he's got to wait to have it unloaded. And the other nasty thing uh, about the unloading process, which I analogize to a third world country road building project. You know, you've seen those all the people running around with backpacks. The sailors didn't do the unloading. The sailors would hit the port of Buffalo and they would get paid their wages. There was no direct deposit. There wasn't checking accounts and stuff like that. 
What's a sailor going to do in Buffalo with cash in his pocket Drink. for a week? What? Did I hear drinking? Uh, and there was other type of activities that were available to uh, Once this type of system was in place, uh, the turnaround time was a week. Not a week, it was a day. And we have bigger and bigger ships now. The, the one that delivers the grain, which ultimately goes to that Archer Daniels mill. Uh, you'll see pictures of that. That's 650 feet long. Imagine how long that would have taken uh, to unload with, with backpacks. So this thing here, and the term we have is, uh, we, we call marine legs, wherever they came out. You'll, you'll see pictures uh, a little bit. But the point I'm saying, it's really, it's a horizontal Big. conveyor belt that got turned on its angle. Uh, it's retractable, and it's got a bucket brigade. Now, uh, yeah, they do it with a vacuum cleaner, in effect. A huge vacuum hose clean, cleans out the ships. Uh, this is an early picture of one of these marine lakes. It almost looks like a clothespin to me, uh, but it has a conveyor belt uh, with these buckets in there. Uh, I've seen plastic buckets, I've seen metal buckets, uh, I've seen uh, one in the Marine A, uh, it's kind of strange, it's got a wooden platform and it's got a weather to it, but they were different ways to accomplish the same thing, getting the grain out of the ship. I just wanted to throw this in, I mean, this is kind of a historic picture, but it shows uh, even now, uh, this is all the way, this is Lake, Lake Superior. We get a lot of uh, grain here from Canada. Uh, and so it comes all the way through the Great Lakes. Some of it now, as you're probably well aware, goes all the way, doesn't come here. It keeps on going uh, and goes, uh, for example, there are grain elevators uh, basically in eastern Quebec. And there they transfer the grain into ships. But these ships are going to go to Europe. They're going to, they're ocean going ones. I mentioned all that, it's, it's fascinating. There is a Smithsonian um, uh, production. I haven't seen it for a while. It was fascinating because uh, just like moving vans, they, they don't like the dead end uh, their, their operations. So the ships coming back from Quebec headed headed toward uh, that area. And, yes. Pardon me? They wanted to fill it so they, they could make money. Right, and what they, what they fill it with is iron ore pellets, which they drop off in Hamilton Harbor at the Stelco or Steel Company of Canada plants. Uh, I say that's where you really see the, the advantage of having the vacuum technology. Otherwise, your cereal the next time uh, when they load it up with green uh, would really be Captain Crunchy. <laughs> All right. I talked a little bit about dangers. And you said 1913 or something like that. This picture actually came from one of the worst explosions in Buffalo. Uh, goes back to 1913. The problem, these facilities uh, many times were made with wood and one spark would set off a fire, but also one spark would set off an explosion. I'm pretty sure this is the one where among the people who were killed was a guy who was the railroad engineer. He was minding his own business. He wasn't making any deliveries. Uh, to the uh, to the plant. This is not along the Buffalo River, but it was in Buffalo. And all of a sudden, there was an explosion that took him out of his train. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, I think, 1913, about 17 killed. The other aspect, and I, I learned this from somebody else on a tour, uh, grain explosions and grain fires generate a lot of heat. They generate a lot of flame. So if you're not killed by the concussion, uh, a lot of these people died from third degree burns. Kind of a brutal way. What was this, the name of that grain mill? Pardon me? Do you know what the name of that grain mill was? I don't. It was back in 19. You go back, uh, use that marvelous tool, uh, yeah. Google, and put down 1913 <laughs> grain, ex, okay. uh, grain elevator ex explosion. Right. You're going get, to get to there, I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't know if I skipped over. I thought I had. No. I did. I have one other uh, more recent. This picture here, uh, it's, I've tried, and I'm, I mean, I've tried to get better pictures uh, than this. Um, one of the things that Buffalo is synonymous with is these concrete grain elevators. Not the first one here, that was in Minneapolis, but 
Buffalo, and we uh, engineered and developed it to an art form almost, uh, more cheaply and more efficiently. And what this is, this is a platform that uh, you and I as workers could stand on. Uh, we might be standing there at three o'clock in the morning because the term is, it's not just slip form, but it's continuous pour. And without going into too much detail, they had a big mold. It was like a double ring of, uh, of things for a cake, but the outer areas where the action is going to be, where they're going to put the concrete, and they made concrete in that uh, platform because they also had around here these posts were jacks. And so they put about four feet of concrete to get the uh, thing going, let it cure for a few hours, then they start jacking it up and it would go upwards at the rate of six inches an hour. And meanwhile, they're making more and more concrete to pour into the mold. And they could adjust the mold a little bit because you needed greater strength at the bottom. But the bottom line is the thing would be done in 10 days. Done would be one set of silos. And they always seem to do them in threes. I haven't found a good explanation for that. I'd like to know. Uh, it may have something to do with the lateral support and drying. But the point is, guys were working here in the middle of the day, middle of the night, uh, people were working all around the clock. And to put it in a time frame, uh, in the sense of a calendar time frame, the big one down there, American, that's 1906. The one next to it that I give the tours in, 1907. I mean, we're not talking about modern amenities. They didn't have the phones, or they, uh, they didn't have power uh, ways of making concrete on the uh, ground and, and you know, blowing it up there. They apparently were making it on, on, on the job as they went along. Uh, these things are across uh, the river, the Buffalo River. A um, little bit of a uh, 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 historic period on this, and you can't see until you get up real close. But that is a marine leg, and this is where the conveyor belt system would pop out to go into a ship uh, hole. These things, if you've ever watched a space program uh, when they're getting ready for a launch down at Cape Canaveral, what do they do? They roll that whole thing out on rail car wheels. Same thing. This stuff could move along on rail car wheels because it's the analogy I make is when you're changing a flat tire, you don't spin a lug nut off entirely and then go to the next one. You start with this thing and you go around there. Otherwise, you got a problem with the, with the wheel. Similarly, when you unload a ship, they take grain out of one hole, and then they'll take grain out of a hole here to lessen the amount of stress on the hull. Well, the reason these things are on rail car wheels is when you got a 650-foot boat parked there, tied up, you don't tell the captain, please, buddy, would you move your ship about 50 feet back? It doesn't work that way. You don't get a favorable response. Here's a little bit, uh, and again, this is uh, right down where the action is now. You can see these holes. You can see, see uh, the extension out there. All right. Anybody know what we call the guys who went down in the hole of a ship? Stevedores. What? Stevedores. They were stevedores, that's one term. Scoop. These were special. Scoopers, right? They were scoopers. scoopers. Famous scooper, Jimmy Griffin. Talk about a tough job. And these guys are uh, almost, you know, cowering in a corner there. Uh, back in the older days, if a guy had a bandana over his face and his nose, he was the head of the game in a sense. Now, uh, OSHA would require a, a lot more protective equipment. Not just uh, breathing apparatus, but earphones and all that. Because these were noisy. But guys would be uh, hopping into this thing uh, it might be 12 feet of grain. And it's kind of like if you've ever gone up a sand dune. Uh, it's a little uh, uncertain. It can start to fall apart on you. You can feel like you're constantly, the stuff moves around. Well, if this device coming down here is taking out a lot of grain at a time, and they got to a point where that bucket type system would be like 50,000 bushels of grain in an hour. I mean, there's a lot of action going on there. Uh, things are moving, and you had to be careful. I went past it. Again. I'll go back. 
maybe manually. Yeah, let me see if I can do it this way. That's not a, a good way to go. Mm -hmm. um, I had one of my cousins when I was seven years old and he was seven years old. Family had a, a vegetable canning business in Batavia. And one day he went with his dad and was walking with his grandfather. For some uh, reason, the kid fell on the conveyor belt and he went through the bean shopping. Mm -hmm. Oh. And that was the end of my cousin. But these type of accidents would happen. Uh, I met one guy on a tour who worked in that flour mill, uh, which was owned by a company called Conagra. Uh, doesn't mean much to most of us until you start saying Peter Pan, and they sold that brand, and it was Marie Callender, and uh, I think Orville Red. They had a lot of stuff, according to practical terms. Uh, but this fell uh, after the flour mill closed in 2002. He had a job as an EMT. And in particular, he said, I got my training on the job. He said, even though Buffalo Fire had a substation basically at the end of uh, Child Street where Ohio is and the, where the bridge is, uh, they couldn't get there fast enough. Sometimes people would get chopped up on uh, various pieces of equipment. There were a lot of injuries that happened. All right, this is the this is the ship I was talking about. This is 653 feet long. Probably comes in about once every six weeks. I only saw it once uh, 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 this year. Uh, it did come back a couple weeks ago on Sunday. I like to show this. If anybody here ever had a problem getting their car in the garage? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get a few scrapes. That, that's this thing carries. 30,000 tons of grain, uh, also known as 1 million bushels of grain. <laughs> they bumped the size. As an aside, uh, this is a, a, a call out, a shout out for uh, another thing that you can see, especially now that Canada has reopened to US traffic. If you haven't had the opportunity to go see the Welland Canal, they have a wonderful uh, museum uh, which, among other things, I went over there uh, uh, before COVID hit, and they had an exhibit as part of the Welland Canal Museum. I'm not quite sure what, but it was on the Spanish flu of 1918. Mm -hmm. And having read all the way it developed there, I got to tell you, it was a good primer of what happened when we got COVID uh, mm -hmm. uh, coming here in a second. But what you can do there is go outside and up where the big ships come through. In other words, most of those are ocean-going ships. Those things are like 700 feet long. Uh, and where folks are in the back row, that's about how close you can get to a ship like that and watch it go through a lot. I mean, that's, that's to me, it's just fun to do stuff like that. Uh, and that's the back, back end of the thing. And this device up here, it looks like a little bit of a white bridge there. Um, it has conveyor belt itself. It's a self-unloader. They they don't need the scoopers anymore. I think the last scooper was like 2003. But the point is, very efficient. And that ship can be <clears throat> emptied of its uh, 30,000 tons of grain in less than a 24-hour period. It's fun to see that uh, ship. I mean, it, 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 it hustles. All right. In the, that's the Ohio Street Bridge. It's up. In the background, there are more silos there. They don't just use the silos uh, for storing grain. That business there is Lafarge Cement Company. They've got a batch plant that's on uh, River Road, but they sell dry cement, cement to a lot of people. This boat, the Argonaut, comes in uh, on a run from uh, around Kingston, Ontario. In other words, across from Rochester. And the reason I focus on this, this was a fun experience for me. Only once have I seen it when both ships were here. If you think back to that picture I showed with the different colors and the course of the Buffalo River, it's not gentle curve, it's right angle curves. It's, it's really tough to get around. And on the other side of the Ohio uh, Bridge where this ship right here would be tied up, I'm loading basically, uh, they can't get this big other ship out at the same time because when it swings its rear end around, uh, it would crash. 
So they take a tugboat, and that's a tugboat here. It's hard to see in the, in the picture, but they pull it all the way up here uh, by Silo City. And there's there's ropes, and uh, you, you, most of you know when you got things under tension, uh, you want to get a, away from the rope because if it breaks, uh, it'll 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 do bad things. So in the midst of this, we got tugboat here. We had another tugboat over there. Uh, and both of the big ships, they got their propellers. They don't go fast. That was interesting to see. Uh, but they sure kick up a lot of water. And in between, whoops, I don't know what they hit. <laughs> oh, we're going the wrong way. No, we got all the way back. Something uh, jumped. There. There. You get it back. There. In this area here, uh, there were waves. It was like Typhoon Lagoon or those other uh, amusement parks in the uh, Orlando Disney area. Somebody, this is July, it's hot. And there are a lot of people out kayaking. The kayakers, they know enough to stay away from here on ships like this. Some guy on a jet ski, he thought he was in hog heaven and he's running up and down there and he's bouncing on the waves. Uh, these people here on the tugboat, I'll put it this way, were encouraging him <laughs> to find another place to play. <laughs> Anybody ever go on the Aquarama? That was a boat, uh, was uh, based in Detroit for a while. It was a pleasure cruise, and they brought it here. This is along Furman Boulevard, uh, another abandoned uh, grain oil. It's no longer there. I think the ship ultimately was... Uh, What they, 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 they scrapped it. But the reason I mentioned that because it kind of shows the, the length of the big expanse of Buffalo's reputation as a grain handling port. That was owned by a cooperative pool in Saskatchewan. Uh, it's known as the Pool Elevator. Old stuff in Canada. All right, now we're getting into Silo City. This is not Silo City. This is Carl Palladino's uh, thing. Anybody ever seen that? No. Uh, anybody want to guess what that was? Beehive. I heard a magic word. Beehive. How do you know that? I was there. You were there. Yeah. When the folks from Rigidite buy the area we call Silo City, basically they found in where the bar is now, the Duende Bar, one of the biggest beehives, uh, honey beehives. And rather than destroy it, uh, Rick Smith went to the people at the School of Architecture and Planning and said, in essence, uh, could you guys come up with a design? And this is the design. You, you, you do the design, we'll build it for you. And this thing was uh, very active. Uh, a couple of times they've had to restock it with bees. This last summer I didn't see anything uh, uh, going on there. But it's, it's kind of an interesting monument. I told you there was going to be some hard work here. In the Marine A silo, um, there is something, and you can just barely see it when, when we do the tours and point out easier. Uh, all these beautiful colored bands are surveyor tape, rolls of surveyor tape. This thing, and I think that the, the other picture may show it, this thing's about 80 feet tall. Uh, and it's got a frame here, and you got a corresponding frame on top, and it's not held up by these bands. It's held up by cables. I would have liked the scene when they raised the thing, which I think <coughs> that was the way it was done. This predates, uh, so this is uh, at least 10 years, it may be older, but this particular art project was a master's thesis <laughs> at UB in the art department. Gentleman had studied, uh, he's from London, Ontario, Gareth Lixty is his name. He'd studied at UB though for his master's, and this is what he submitted. That's a pretty impressive thing. Used to be you could go touch it. Uh, and then they uh, found that the problem was a particular silo would flood in the wintertime. So they moved it up. It's, I mean, you can't touch it uh, at all. But it's just, and all it is in one sense, it's two wooden frames with a whole bunch of rolls of unrolled land surveyor tape. That's one piece of art. Right next door to it is another one. This one, I, fortunately, I, I bring in some heavy-duty flashlights. This is one one. I, I use this also. The insides of these silos are pretty darn smooth, the concrete. 
you had a road that was that smooth, uh, it would be uh, smooth nice, riding. Yeah. Nice. But look at this is a better picture coming up. You're looking at 500 pounds of plastic. This one is called Gears. Uh, it was done by two people, one of whom is from the West New York area. It's not done at the master stages. That's been hanging up there uh, for over 10 years. There's no other art gallery that I'm familiar with in Western New York where you could hang that. And what Rick Smith, the owner of Rigid Eye, has been very good with these people. They don't charge for this stuff. You want to hang the stuff up there? The only thing is they're not going to uh, they're not going to take care of it for you. Uh, so if it starts to deteriorate, and there's other artworks that have deteriorated. Um, you want to reclaim it? It's yours. And if we ever need to use uh, this, if we come up with some other use, because you're going to hear a little bit about reuse, um, then your option is to remove it, or we may have to uh, uh, remove it for you. This is down across from Canal Side. It's the silos, which are no longer in business, uh, called the connecting silos, which are basically where the uh, Skyway is. Talk about creative reuse of an abandoned facility. These things are not, I mean, the use of light, uh, we've all seen with Niagara Falls, and it beautifies the waters. The waters by themselves are beautiful as art. But this dog on all, that to me, that just looks beautiful. That's another, you got my different colors down there. Uh, so it, it's a way of beautifying and uh, bringing people down. Uh, giving people further reasons to come down to our uh, beautiful waterfront now. This is back at Silo City. When I take people up on a tour, the vertical tour, uh, about a third of the way up, I suggest uh, there are things that I call portholes. I don't know, uh, they're like circular windows. To me, take and, and this because there's some construction I want to tell you about in a moment, but instead of just taking a photograph of a broad expanse, and I've done that many times, uh, and then you can't re really remember. I think framing a photo like this, it, this is more art to me. This is something uh, uh, you could hang up in the house. Hmm. Ohio Street Bridge, active grain elevator. This is the old thing. We used to actually take people across this. Uh, it wasn't bad. I hear oohs and ahs. It was stable. But in the middle of the summertime, it was also about 100 degrees. Uh, it was like a real sweat box. Uh, they connected these two uh, facilities. This one, at the time the connection occurs, was a flour mill. And over here is what they would call a malting operation, where they took barley and they, they let it grow for a short period of time uh, and, and changed starch into sugar so they could use the malted stuff for beer and ale. Uh, but over here, this thing here is a marine leg, but it was a fixed marine leg. Because it was fixed, they could put a spiral staircase. Did anybody here ever take the vertical tour at uh, Silo City? Um, it, we've all heard when you got, uh, when you're taking the grandkids or when you're taking the kids, are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> it's a hundred feet going round and round and round. And we always told people don't look up because rust will come down and things like that. But the, the, the bottom line is the staircase got a little bit shaky and for about five years we haven't been able to take people there. This is in the middle of one of those uh, buildings. It's in the uh, uh, Perot building. But well, when you look at the, you know, this is part of me, this is the American building. Uh, but the point is, uh, somebody says we got a we got a clog in uh, uh, unit number five. Go fix it. My first question is, which one are you talking about? You go over there and you look at it. There are so many pipes in areas. Part of the stuff is a retrofitting, I think, because these buildings, which originated 1906, 1907, uh, they didn't really have good ventilation. They didn't have good air control, what they figured out afterwards, we're gonna add this, we'll add that. Uh, some of the places like the Darwin Martin House, they've had a retrofit, they had to put ductwork in where ductwork never existed before. It's a real challenge. All right, I'm gonna show you some nasty pictures. Mm -hmm. But I want you to look at these. Those are roller bearings. That's a conveyor belt. And this device, which is kind of hard to see, is called a tripper car. 
grain would be going on the conveyor belt, and then there would be an arm, just like a but a, a big ruler, but a board that would go down, and it would force the grain down side channels into the uh, silo poles itself. See, when you get a bushel of corn or a bushel of grain, I think you and I we can understand that. But if you got 10,000 or 100,000 bushels, you're not going to get your hands around it. And really, the way they treat grain is uh, it's like a commodity, a bulk commodity. They get it in there, they weigh it, and then they uh, chest test, pardon me, the moisture content. Uh, but there's a reason I focus right there on the roller bearings. That's just a picture I threw in because I like it, it's beautiful. I'm probably going to take that one out. When they have explosions, when they have real bad problems. You could be down at the end of this corridor. There's nothing to stop that explosion. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's channeled um, pretty much and can, can take people out. Uh, these are what they look like. This is obviously, it's abandoned. That's, that's, that was at Pillsbury. That was on Gansett Street. Whoops. Um, <laughs> just touch. Yeah. Okay, we got another one. Yeah, this is not Buffalo. It sounds fortunate. This is Kansas. Uh, yeah. Dorothy, um, we're not in Kansas. No, you're in Kansas here. Um, this facility, I'll put it in practical numbers. The one in Buffalo that I show you, the Marine A, that's about 450 feet long. This is about 2,400 feet long. Wow. And they had some problems. You can see a little bit up here. You're going to see a few more pictures. They had one hell of a boom. The caps, I'm told here, blew which off. Have blew off. Uh, they're not bottle caps. They're about two tons a piece. That was one hell of an explosion. This poor guy's waiting for a helicopter to meta back him up. I think he's in shock from other pictures I've seen. You know, he's lucky to be alive. All right, the reason I showed you that roller bearing, um, the uh, uh, federal government OSHA office came in, like the air crash we had here in West New York where the transportation safety board was. What happened? We don't want to have it happen again. They figured out at this location one of those rollers, somebody had not adequately greased the roller bearings in there. And it seized up, and the momentum of the grain caused metal to scrape against bare metal. One spark. Eight men killed, uh, about another dozen severely injured. This is back in Buffalo. Look. Ask people, particularly if you're sitting in the front row, does this guy look happy? <laughs> Next question. Anybody know what his name is? Anybody know what his first name is? Michael. Michael. Why do you think Michael? <laughs> he owns that boat. He owns that boat. Oh. This is Michael Tewksbury. Oh. Is that one that hit the bridge? It's a very famous bridge. 1959. It hits the Michigan Avenue Bridge, and what it didn't take down uh, one night in January, uh, the rest of it fell down the next day, and there was no bridge at Michigan Avenue uh, for about a year and a half because they had to build a new one. Uh, interesting story about this. He's up from Cleveland the next day. That's his ship. The other ship that uh, uh, hit his ship and sent his ship down the Buffalo River under the Ohio Street Bridge uh, no. was owned by another company. Is that the one that burned and then the Edward the Cotter hit it? Hit no, it? no, it, it was uh, sitting up there. They were uh, drying grain out, and it uh, uh, it just broke loose uh, when there was a huge uh, ice jam at the juncture of uh, Casanova Creek and uh, Buffalo River broke loose upstream in the white. This is more pictures. This is the car. Yeah, that, you know that's a national historic uh, landmark. Yeah, but which was that? That's not the one where the cot, the original cot, of burn. I don't know I, that. I haven't gotten into this. I'm just focusing on the bridge. This is uh, after they managed to pull the ship out initially, before that picture that 
uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Tewksbury was taken. Uh, the other ship, by the way, was owned by another shipping company based in Cleveland, which was owned by the Steinbrenner family. And one of the guys who was called in to testify was a young George Steinbrenner. Uh, and as an aside, judges are not supposed to do this. Uh, the judge made some edit, the local judge uh, made a, a comment to the effect uh, after listening to Mr. Steinbrenner testify about the only reason he thought that the, he was the vice president of the corporation was his dad owned the corporation. That's kind of a, that's a <laughs> nice. bad shot. This is the picture I have that you can look up that close. This is all ice. This is the Tewksbury. Uh, this, sh uh, this ship here is the other one, uh, McGilvey Shires. This is where the Cheerios plant building is. It's hard to see, but that's where the Michigan Avenue bridge is down into the river. All this ice is a, a, a tiding of bad news for the people in the first ward. The estimate, and I've been trying to get pictures of, of, of what really went on, is about 100 acres flooded over the first ward. Mm -hmm. Some people had six feet of water in their house. They didn't have flood insurance back then. Mm -hmm. And the two shipping companies got into one of these fights like it's not my fault. And everybody pointed the fingers at the city of Buffalo. And many of you probably have heard this story. Uh, they had two operating engineers at that bridge uh, late at night on Wednesday, January, whose responsibility was to raise the bridge whenever a ship came through. And it didn't matter if the ship was loose by itself or whether it was under power, but the guys were not on the job. Anybody know where the guys were hanging out? Swanee House. The Swanee House. A fine establishment. And there was a, one, of the, one of the things that did not make it into uh, the court records is that the Coast Guard and Buffalo Fire tried and tried to get the people at the bridge to alert them that this ship was loose and coming down there. And they couldn't get any answer. And they finally tried the Swanee House. <laughs> and nobody picked up for a while. They kept trying. Finally, this is the lore, is that the guy who was the bartender said, well, I thought it was some guy's wife. And she wanted me to shag her husband home. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't pick up the phone. Uh, oh. I want to get through this. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this is just to show you in its heyday, there were a lot of ships uh, in Buffalo Harbor. Um, there really were. I threw this in, and I don't know if this was uh, in the business here, but um, the, I had three sets of grandparents. Uh, my dad was killed in the war, and my mother remarried in 49. Um, but two out of the three went bankrupt during the Great Depression. And there's a book which, if you get a chance in the library, do have copies of this, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. It's a very touching story. Uh, it was done in the 1930s. A uh, guy by the name of James Agee, a famous uh, American author, interviewed people in Alabama, sharecroppers, and a guy by the name of Walker Evans, who was a famous photographer, he took pictures of some of these people. There's one picture of a little girl. It's To me, it was just so haunting. But the point is, those people were what we would call dirt poor. How dirt poor people dress their kids in gunny sacks. They would get these old flour mills, which were basically burlap. Somebody came up with the bright idea, well, if people are wearing burlap, maybe we can make their life a little bit more interesting, but we can also uh, get a little advertising. So they started jazzing up these bags. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the reason why I show that. Uh, and I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a different type of flower, which was not made in Buffalo, uh, but God bless them for doing minor things like that. The only reason I show you this, being in the grain business, um, was a, I wouldn't say hit or miss, but a lot of times it went downhill fast. This thing that goes up and down is the grain receipts. This other one is, what was the size of the storage capacity in, in, in the grain elevators? Big difference. Things could change. 19, yeah, 1925 though, 
that's when the current Welland Canal, the fourth Welland Canal opened. Um, we used to process a lot of uh, grain here for animal feed. <clears throat> Literally, from one year to the next, 1932 it opens, 1933, grain receipts in that area were down 130 million bushels. That's, that's, that's a lot of grain by any means. It just changed rapidly. And this was the sad type of story. This is not along the Buffalo River. This is not one of the other flour mills. Cargo, they're just saying, we got an old antiquated mill in Buffalo. We cannot justify putting any money in to that mill. We're going to close it. And that's really uh, one of the things that was happening. There was a long-term discouragement. And notice, that's later. Now, that's 1994. It's just uh, for some of these facilities, the incentive to modernize went out of the way. Uh, this is intended to be sort of pictures of the future and wrap it up. This particular thing, that's uh, the American uh, uh, silos that are there. This is where they actually crush the uh, flour in here and, and they uh, had the bagging facilities, they had the shipping facilities. This will be presumably, at least by next year, and I don't think it's gonna get done, about 160 apartments, right along the Buffalo River. Half of them, I guess, are uh, what they are income qualification, half of them are a market rate. The income qualification, they had a lottery for some. People wanna live there. If you go along Ohio Street, in that um, stretch between the Ohio Street Bridge and the Swanee House, Michigan Avenue Bridge, uh, two new, uh, relatively new apartment buildings were put in there along the Buffalo 